This is Desalony, and welcome to episode 22 of 90s Overlooked Underheard. So, we're about halfway through the decade in 1995 in this series. And um, as I've discussed in a previous video, uh, the U UK indie music scene in 95 was kind of dominated, at least kind of on the surface, through the media via Britpop. And uh, yeah, so in the Animals That Swim episode, uh, episode 18, uh, we were kind of keen to point out that Britpop was ostensibly kind of English pop. It, it, this, this was very English in origin, in focus. Throughout the 90s, throughout the 80s, um, there was a part of the UK that always was defiantly uh, had its own identity, um, and that's Scotland. So if you're talking about the Scottish indie scene, um, it was always a kind of a hotbed of great bands, and um, some of the most you know enduring bands of that period of the 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, in indie alternative terms, just names like the Jesus and Mary Chain, uh, the Cocteau Twins, uh, Teenage Fan Club. Um, yeah, there was a very strong kind of identity around the Scottish independence scene. Um, and if we wind back to the kind of the very early part of the 80s, one of the first kind of um, appearances of this de defiantly kind of Scottish thing was what became known as the Sound of Young Scotland, um, which was kind of a post-punk kind of early indie movement of Scottish bands, which was kind of focused around a label called Postcard Records. Um, so you'd be looking at bands of this period, like uh, Altered Images were the first kind of post-punk kind of indie crossover band, I think, to kind of hit the charts in a big way. But there were plenty of other bands like Joseph K, uh, Orange Juice, Aztec Camera, The Bluebells. Um, and one other really important band of this period who never actually released on Postcard at its original kind of time of coming into being was the fire engines um these released uh, via bob last's fast product label so the fire engines were a very short-lived uh, very distinctive band um that formed in about 1979 and, and they were done by the end of 1981 um they were led by the singer and guitarist davy henderson um and they had kind of a very discordant very clattery very post-punk take on pop, angular, repetitive, weirdly kind of funky, um, but noisy and catchy somehow at the same time. Um, probably their most well-remembered track would be the single Candy Skin. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's a, it was a firm favourite of John Peel. But as I say, they split um, kind of around about the end of 81 going into 82. Um, and at this point, Davy Henderson was kind of knocking around for a while um, and managed to kind of coalesce his kind of songwriting efforts together in 1983 into a band called Win. So yeah, Win were kind of a, a more palatable, more kind of um, determinedly poppy band than the Fire Engines ever were. And they did have some, some quite considerable success uh, in Scotland. Um, what happened, though, I think with Wynn was that um, they did end up getting signed to a major label and they kind of took the route that a lot of bands of the early 80s, post-punk kind of indie bands had, of this kind of, um, at the time it was called the new pop. So I'm thinking now of bands like um, uh, ABC or even even the Human League or uh, Scritti Politti, who'd come from a kind of a quite uh, alternative post-punk indie, you know, avant-garde background but made a conscious effort that they were going to create pop music, that they were going to make the kind of the slickest, best sounding pop music they could. By the time this happened to win, though, we were, you're looking at about 1987, I think, uh, when the first of their two albums came out on a major label. And um, I think this kind of thing had started to run its course, really. Um, in a lot of ways, the kind of the, the big, shiny pop acts of the day had been kind of taken back in-house. Um, this was kind of the start of the return of the manufactured pop era. So uh, Stock, Aitken and Walk Waterman, you know, Kylie Minogue, the whole stable there. And so trying to kind of impose this kind of shiny, plasticky, kind of very um, 
palatable pop sound onto uh, indie acts just didn't seem to work as well at this point. Uh, Davey Henderson felt the band had been effectively kind of shattered of their own recordings. Um, they would literally go in and sample all the instruments they needed, and then it was handed over to a production team who did everything. And the results are these very, very slick, very, very plastic, very process sounding records. The songs are still there, but they never transferred into success for Win, and, and, and they were dropped by their label sometime around about 1990. Uh, Davey regrouped um, shortly afterwards. It took him a year or so, but uh, he formed the band that we're going to be talking about today, uh, and that band is The Nectarine Number no. 9. Um, they came together in 91, and uh, the, shortly thereafter, the band released their debut album um, on the recently um, rebooted Postcard label. In fact, this was Henderson's first official Postcard release, despite the Fire Engines being one of the original, you know, Sound of Young Scotland bands. Um, I should explain about the album, really, because the title from the title, A Sea With Three Stars, it sounds like it's about some kind of, you know... Uh, seascape or a nighttime kind of view of the ocean when actually if i show you the album sleeve itself it should be immediately apparent what they were talking about so fast forward a couple of years and a few eps later and we get to the second album and that's the album we're talking about today which is saint jack released in july of 1995. The Nectarine number nine, their sound is a very definite fusion, I think, of the pop kind of sensibilities that Davy Anderson was trying to bring, bring to win with that kind of dissonant, nervy, clattery sound of the fire engines. Um, yeah, you couldn't really hope to fuse the two things in a better way than he managed with the nectarine number nine and particularly so on this album saint jack so yeah on this album Hen henderson's guitar sound is, is typically davy henderson it has these wormy kind of little single note lines with these kind of maddening kind of almost bowling t-rex kind of riffs it's a very unique style which he developed early on um in the fire engines when he realized that chords were quite difficult so we developed this kind of signature, kind of single note sound with lots of riffing. And yeah, the rhythm section adds lots of kind of clatter uh, and kind of, uh, you know, weird off key repetition and the layering of the sound of the guitars, because there are multiple guitars within Nectarine number no. nine. It gives you almost a kind of a beef hearty kind of sound, less, less ornate, though, and definitely just more focused on the pop songs themselves that, that Davey was writing. Um, yeah, rhythmically, yeah, very, very kind of thuddy, tight, dead, almost deadened drum sounds. Really recalls kind of the stripped down sound of Mo Tucker in the Velvet Underground. They would use copious amount of samples from movies and TV and all sorts of places. Um, and uh, I think the defining thing about um, the Nectarine Number no. Nine sound that differentiates them from certainly the fire engines is. This isn't a funky kind of feel. Uh, the fire engines had this kind of this kind of funk punk kind of feel almost. But Nectarine number no. nine has this kind of almost glam kind of clattering kind of boogie uh, feel going on. Um, not a hundred miles away from something like the Fall, but imagine the Fall trying to play T Rex songs or T Rex trying to play Fall songs. Um, that would kind of get you in the right ballpark, I think. But yeah, uh, and Davy Henderson's voice is, as ever, this kind of high, clear, reedy sound, sung in a kind of a trademark, kind of adopted, kind of American accent. Yeah, I think nothing differentiates uh, any better than this, why kind of Britpop was seen as kind of an English kind of thing. Um, if you look at the kind of sounds that the Nectarine Number no. 9 were using, Definite kind of nods to kind of this glam sound, you know, the, the kind of the Boland sound almost in 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 an odd kind of very off kilter way. But several of the other kind of bigger Britpop bands, I think, you know, Oasis were definitely doing it. Um, Pulp definitely were, uh, even Suede were using kind of glam 
sounds, and glam textures, but the Nectarine Number no. 9 never got a sniff of being anywhere near these bands in terms of recognition or coverage by the media. So some key tracks. Um, we'll start with St. Jack, the title track, which kicks off the album. Uh, it takes its name from a 1979 movie by Peter Bogdanovich, uh, based on a novel by uh, Paul Theroux. Uh, the novel concerns this kind of uh, expat American in uh, Singapore called Jack Flowers, who kind of sets up as a as a pimp, tries to create his own brothel, and gets in kind of different scrapes with the kind of the, the triads, the crime gangs, and ultimately with the CIA. Yeah, both the novel and the movie are at pains to kind of slowly establish that despite the kind of milieu that Jack Flowers finds himself working in, you know, he's involved in this or this seedy criminal activity, that he's a good hearted, he's a moral man. He tries to do the right thing, given the circumstances he's dealing with. Um, I think it makes a great central figure for this album because the album is very, very autobiographical and Davy Henson clearly strongly identified with the character of Jack Flowers. Um, yeah, this kind of good man, but compromised. Um, yeah. Um, if you take some of the lyrics from St. Jack, um, he's kind of recounting his introduction to the story of St. Jack. Henderson sings, uh, made me want to sleep, but the tears come cheap. So can I buy your eyes? Can't get these ones to dry. Yeah, it sounds like he made a very strong emotional connection with the movie straight away and its main character, despite this character's failings. I mean, Henson himself says, you know, he refers to him as this doggy bag was St. Jack. There's probably a bit more at play here, but um, the kind of oblique, unsparing kind of confessional feel of the album... Um, yeah, there's guilt, there's there's remorse, there's sadness running through a lot of the songs. It sounds quite raw and, uh, and autobiographical, and maybe taking this character of Saint Jack kind of takes kind of acts as a kind of a replacement for Davy himself in the context of the album, or a figurehead maybe. But as for the music on Saint Jack, the track, um. Yeah, it kicks in immediately with this huge stomping kind of bowl and boogie before it kind of settles into this kind of more laid back, kind of rolling, almost Dylan-esque kind of uh, rhythm throughout the verses. Oh, it's a very, very captivating, exciting opener. It just grabs you straight from the off. Throughout the album, the band shift between kind of this set of prettier, kind of simpler Velvet Underground style song with a kind of signature edge. And these other songs, these kind of songs with this kind of Captain Beefhearty and kind of clatter, this jerky post-punk kind of feel, shifting time signatures, gnarly little kind of lumpy, bluesy guitar figures dropping in and out. Um, it adds the record a real kind of personality and a balance. Um, yeah, it, it, it's an odd record to sum up. It just all hangs together so perfectly. Um a friend of mine once said to me, and he claimed this was a quote from, from Lou Reed, but I've never checked that out, so, so please excuse me if it isn't. But he said that Lou Reed claimed that the only thing that you needed to make good music was taste. Um, I think this album is a very good kind of indicator of that idea. Um, Davy Henderson's got extremely good taste and that shines through the kind of the spiky the untrained kind of sound of the fire engines all the way through to nectarine number no. nine he really draws from a wonderfully kind of diverse set of influences pulls them together in a kind of a magic way so of the songs in this kind of simpler kind of prettier more velvet underground kind of category uh, there are a couple i mean this asshole has been burned too many times before is much more of a kind of an upbeat kind of carousel kind of chuggy kind of song um it's very poppy it ends with this kind of burst of like sister ray style organ but it never loses sight of the fact that it's a simple catchy pop song and um yeah it seems to kind of address this 
this treadmill of disillusion that is the music industry. And, you know, there are hints in there of the kind of the self-medication that, that as an artist, you may be required to kind of perform just to get you through this horrible machinery. Unloaded for You starts kind of even gentler and more pretty sounding, but it turns into what is the most kind of starkly confessional song on the album. Uh, Davy sings, I made it home last night. I want a gold star. Boy, what an achievement. It's raining here. Flowers of fear. I'm not scared a bit. I'm pissing beer to the very last tear. Every single drop of it. He's clearly singing here about sobriety and the difficulty of staying, you know, unloaded. Um... Yeah, this is a much kind of prettier kind of pale blue eyes style Velvet Underground, not the kind of jarring organ led Sister Ray style sound. Uh, with all this talk about con confessional music and bearing bearing your soul, I, I don't want to make this sound like this is like a, a such a dark album that it makes it kind of difficult to approach. The music on the album is so kind of rip roaring and jolting and electrified and this kind of deep kind of scrambled pop that you can kind of lose yourself in that it's sometimes difficult to uh, comprehend the depths that Henderson is plumbing when he's singing. Um, you just get carried along on this, this kind of thumping, riffing, fragmented ride that he takes you on. There are other examples all through the album. Um, Firecrackers rides this kind of maddening, kind of pounding, almost a Motown beat over this kind of bed of like these jousting, riffing guitars, repetitive, like joyous, ecstatic pop song. Um, Can't Scratch Out is much darker, kind of rumbling meditation. Um, and it seems to be addressing this idea that you can't escape your past deeds. You now, on this one, Henderson sings, um, but what happens, happens. It's what it's about. Now, it's only the sentiment you can't scratch out. And on uh, My Trap Lightning, um, musically, a really, really daring song. All these pirouetting kind of switches in time signature shaped around this kind of knotty, euphoric, kind of squiggly guitar shapes. Um, it's the most Beefheart inspired moment on the album. And this is one which seems to kind of address the idea of the creative impulse and the things that you have to do to kind of kickstart it. The idea of the lightning being trapped inside you. Um, Henderson sings, um, the compasses are fake. You've lost your way. You kick the dust five, five times a day. Your holy ghosts lost in the post. Um, this is a great song. It's this marvellous, wired, manic energy kind of powers through it. And the clattering kind of momentum takes you right through to the song's close. It's fantastic. There are other standout tracks. Um, there's a very delicate instrumental interlude called Curdled Fragments. Again, it seems to offer this very gentle take on the kind of subdued kind of stripped back Velvet Underground sound. Another interesting kind of diversion mid-album is um, the introduction of the late Jock Scott, the uh, kind of, uh, do you call him a punk poet, I guess, maybe? Um, yeah, he sings or takes the lead lyric on uh, just another fucked up little druggie in the scene. This dark, funny, clattering, disjointed little song, um, which just sits in the middle of the album um, on its own. Um, yeah, the Nectary number no. nine would go on to kind of back uh, Jock Scott on, uh, on his solo album, My Personal Culloden. So um, there's another recommendation for you if the Nectary number no. nine sound does happen to appeal to you as much as it does to me. So yeah, um, just a really great kind of dark, confessional, but supremely kind of poppy um, indie kind of guitar record. Yeah, I really, really rate this record. Um, at a time when a lot of kind of British indie music was, I think, creatively in a bit of a rut, certainly at the top table. Um, it was records like St. Jack that kind of sustained us through this period. So we're out for another episode. Um, 
yeah, those things down there, you know what to do. Um, in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, please join me again for another episode soon of 90s Overlooked Underheard. Bye for now.